God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the message that we receive through your word, and we thank you for sometimes the struggle that we have in it. Help us to see you wherever you are in all days and all times, and as we study your word and hear it this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. So I don't know about you, but I struggled with this chapter this week. We, and you'll notice in your bulletin, I have to tell you that on about Thursday, the Holy Spirit, she like got a hold of me and said, no, you're not writing about giants. Um, You're going to write about something else. And so the scripture that is listed in the bulletin is also wrong. Um, The scripture that I'm going to read this morning is from Joshua, some selected verses from chapter 6 and 12. So listen as we hear the word of God. On the seventh day they rose at daybreak and marched around the city as before. Only on this day they marched around seven times instead of once. The seventh time around as the priests blew their shofars, Joshua commanded the people, Now shout! Yahweh has given you the city. Then the shofars blew, and as soon as the people heard the sound of the shofars, they raised a tremendous war cry, and the walls came crashing down to the ground. The people rushed into the city, everyone surging straight ahead, and they captured it. They placed everything in the city under a sacred ban, putting every living thing to the sword, the women, the men, the young and old, the cattle and the sheep and the donkeys. The city and everything in it was burned completely to the ground, except for the silver and the gold and the copper iron vessels which were put in God's treasury house. Only Rahab, the innkeeper, and her family were saved because they had, she had saved the spies that Joshua sent out to scout the land. Then Joshua pronounced a solemn oath, the curse of Yahweh be upon anyone who attempts to rebuild Jericho. May their firstborn be laid down as its foundation and their youngest set up at its gates. So Yahweh was with Joshua and Joshua's fame spread throughout the land. And then Joshua waged war against all the rulers. No town, with the exception of the Hivites dwelling in Gibeon, made a treaty with the children of Israel. All were taken in battle. For Yahweh had hardened their hearts for war against Israel so that they would be put under the sacred ban, which ensured that no mercy would be shown to them and they would be completely annihilated, just as Yahweh had commanded Moses. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. So as I said, I'm sort of confessing, I I really struggled with this chapter. Um, The story, the way that it's laid out, the book, is this week you read the entire chapter of Joshua. We find in this chapter the conquering of Jericho. After the Israelites' long 40-year journey out in the desert, they finally get there and step into the promise that God has for them in the land flowing with milk and honey, the promised land. By the time we reach the book of Joshua, having read the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, We're learning that in confirmation. We are well acquainted with God's promise to the Israelites, the promise of that land filled with milk and honey. And this isn't the first time that we hear of God's bounty for us because we heard about it in the first chapters of Genesis in the Garden of Eden, the bounty that God wanted us to live in. And then we continue to hear about it throughout Abraham's journeys, Abraham and Sarah, and there are many places, and I'm only going to read three of them. When Abraham left Haran, he traveled through the land as far as the sacred place at Shechem, at the Oak of Morah. The Canaanites lived in the land at that time, and the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I give this land to your descendants. So Abraham built an altar there 
to the Lord. And then later on, there's this covenantal sacrifice that happens where the animal is split in two and God comes down and walks, goes through that split. And it says, After the sun had set and the darkness had deepened, a smoking vessel with fiery flame passed between the split-opened animals. That day the Lord cut a covenant with Abraham and said to your descendants, I give this land from Egypt's river to the great Euphrates. And then there was the covenant of circumcision. And at that time, God said to Abraham, I will set up a covenant with you and your descendants. Every generation will have this enduring covenant. I will be your God and I will be your descendants' God. I will give you and your descendants the land in which you are now immigrants, the whole land of Canaan. And there are more. I think that's enough. We get the point. God continually reminded us of this promise all through Genesis, all through Exodus, all the way up until we meet with Joshua. And at the time we reach the Exodus, where Moses is leading the people out of Israel, it has been almost, roughly, 430 years. Additionally, it would take them another 40 years wandering around because they turned their back. So that brings us to 470 years. And if my calculations are um, semi-right, I've read somewhere that it was almost 600 years from the Abrahamic covenant until the Israelites landed in the land of milk and honey. So we're going to get back to that in a minute because that timeline, that reminder um, is important. But for now, I'm going to return back to the beginning when I said I struggled with the book of Joshua. And again, the book is laid out so that you take it in such big chunks that we can't just look at the good and the popular verses, the good and the easy, nice stories, like Joshua 1.9. I hereby command you to be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And there's another one in Joshua 24 But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served, the gods of the Euphrates, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you are living. But for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. The truth is, the first half of the book of Joshua details not only the fall of Jericho, but the many battles that followed. Joshua and the Israelites went out through greater Canaan and conquered. And in those battles, 31, at least, 31 kings were killed. Their cities were plundered of all of their goods. Their people were all killed. Wives, husbands, uncles, cousins, grandparents, grandchildren, young and old, healthy and not healthy, alike. The cities were utterly destroyed. The buildings and the structures were knocked down to the ground so that nothing was left. Not one building, not one bale of straw, not one living thing. And we can go through each chapter and find and cherry pick those verses and those stories out. In chapter one, we have the be strong and courageous verse. In chapter two, it's entering in the promised land and Rahab In chapter 3, they carry the ark across the Jordan River and God makes the way clear for them to cross. And it goes on like that throughout not only the book of Joshua, but throughout the Bible. It isn't that I was unaware of the stories that are contained in Joshua. Like I didn't suddenly discover them and go into emotional, spiritual tailspin saying, oh my gosh, that's in there. But it is precisely because I knew those stories were in there that I found myself grappling with God. I read Joshua in the past, and I chose to look away 
from those parts that were not so nice, those parts that maybe were bad, not good. I focus solely on God's victory, which is the, the point of the chapter, and left everything else out. So who here watches like Netflix and Amazon and do you binge watch? Yeah, I, well I do. That's another confession. <laughs> um, they have these great series on um, Netflix and Amazon Prime uh, and I've been watching some of them about the Vietnam War, World War I, and World War II. And I was reminded of how tragic the carnage of war is. What's left over after the governments and the individuals in power wield that power with seeming disregard for life. I couldn't come to any sort of understanding how a few people could just make a decision and take the lives away from so many people. And when I look at those wars, I have trouble reconciling with what's going on in Joshua and with the God I worship as a Christian. And that's the struggle. I thought, how can such a loving, caring, and grace-giving God allow or do such things or order such things? And I suppose no matter how much we pray to God, study God's words, and discuss them with others, we will never understand 100%. I mean, just a couple weeks ago, Pastor Dave did a portion of the story on the Ten Commandments. And the Sixth Commandment says, Thou shalt not kill. So God tells us not to take a life and then sends Joshua and the Israelites in to wipe out this whole territory. And as we read through Joshua, we struggle to understand where God is at work in it, in the midst of the war and the destruction. As we live our lives, we are confronted with our own battles and our own wars, our own issues, our own struggles, and we question the same way, God, where are you in it? So where does that leave us in this conundrum? Earlier, I said that we would get back to that covenantal repeat and the timeline and the years passing by and Adam and Eve and the garden. Well, in our studies, we are following two main threads, right? The upper story, God's story, and the lower story, which is our story. They are not two completely isolated threads, though. They are completely and utterly intertwined so tightly that we cannot see where one ends and one begins. And yet there are those two threads meeting and where they do meet, where that struggle is found, is exactly where we find God. There's a supplemental book to the story called The Heart of the Story, and I have it at home, so if you, you want to look at it, I can bring that in. On the back cover, the author Randy Frazee invites us, saying this, Discover your story within the grand epic of God's one story. I also have a colleague and a mentor by the name of David Rohr who says to me sometimes when I'm in that struggle, MP, you need to pray for God to show you where God is at work in this situation and pray that God would reveal to you how you can be part of it. So I admit that neither one of these takes away the bad stuff, that stuff we don't want to look at. What it does do is it reminds that there's something bigger going on, that upper story. We are not meant to have complete understanding. That was apparent when God threw Adam and Eve out of the garden after they ate the apple, right? But there are several things that jumped out at me through Joshua where I found God. First, God displays God's long-suffering. 
before acting against humankind, it was only after 600 years of sinful behavior that grew into total rejection of Yahweh that God took action against the Canaanites. The land was given to the Israelites, but more so it was taken away from the Canaanites after their sinful, abhorrent ways, their rejection of God, and their worship of other gods. Yahweh waited 600 years, hoping that they would turn back. Next, God promises to always be with us in that Verse in Joshua 1, 9, Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And lastly, and thank God, God keeps promises. God promised the land of Canaan to the Israelites 600 years before the fall of Jericho, and God followed through. Though the upper story and the lower story cannot be torn from one another, they are not the same. Our understanding is not God's understanding, and our ways are not God's ways. We will never completely understand, but we keep striving and praying and seeking. And as God promised to deliver the land of milk and honey to the Israelites, God promised the world a savior. God followed through on that promise in the person of Jesus Christ. So we live our lives, our story, holding on to that hope that we have in Jesus as we seek out where God is at work in the world and in our lives. And we pray asking the question, Oh God, How can we take part in your story? Amen.